Thanks for your interest and welcome. In this lecture I explain the story of Adam and Eve in the light of the teaching of Richard Dawkins, Thomas Aquinas and Paul. I conclude that we can give up the assumption that humanity originates genetically from a primal couple, Adam and Eve, without giving up the teaching of original sin and atonement. Evolution is the smartest form of creation. The presentation follows this paper. Your donation will help us to promote the symbiosis between science and faith. Richard Dawkins cast doubt on the Christian belief with questions like this. Dawkins asks, and he answers. Dawkins objects to the Christian belief by means of a brilliant thought experiment. Dawkins' objection shows plainly that Christian believers should be able to answer the question, Are these creatures merely human animals, or are they human persons with a spiritual soul? We will show that Richard Dawkins is right when he says that there never was a first couple of Homo sapiens or Homo habilis, but he is wrong when he says that there never was a first couple of human persons. Here is the plan of the presentation in three parts. First point, the disappearance of the intermediate forms. Chimps are likely the genetically closest relatives to humans. Nonetheless, chimps and humans appear today as two sharply separated species that cannot interbreed with each other. There is much more morphological and genetic divergence between humans and chimps than there is between any two humans. The species we meet today were not constant forms since the dawn of animal life, but evolved by natural selection from common ancestral intermediate varieties. This was the prediction by Charles Darwin. And the fossil record provides overwhelming evidence about these intermediate varieties and confirms Darwin's prediction, the evolution theory. The main Intermediate varieties between chimps and humans are sketched in this figure. The lineage of chimps and the lineage of humans converge in the past into a pan homo, homo less common ancestor, and this common ancestor population, divided by six million years ago into the branch of pan containing the ancestor um, of today chimps and the branch Australopithecus containing the ancestors of humans. Between three and two million years ago, different forms of Australopithecus evolved, for instance, Australopithecus afarensis with the famous Lossi. Australopithecus sediva can be considered a direct uh, ancestor of humans. By two million years ago evolved Homo habilis. There is a debate, controversial debate, about whether habilis was the first hominid using stone tools and there is even debate about whether Habilis belongs to the genus Homo or to the genus 
Australopithecus. By 1.5 million years ago, evolved Homo erectus, and uh, about 100,000 years ago, we find four different species of humans, sapiens, neanderthals, denisovans, fluorescences. Also here, there is debate uh, about whether these four forms are different species or four different subspecies of the same species. Today, it is largely admitted in the community that sapiens, neanderthals, denisovans and fluorescences are four different species, mainly by reasons of morphological differences and genetic divergence. Nonetheless, 80,000 years ago, there was interbreeding between Neanderthals and uh, archaic Homo sapiens, and uh, by about 40,000 years ago, Denisovans interbred with Homo sapiens as well. An important data is that uh, 30,000 years ago, Neanderthals disappeared and a bit later, about 12,000 years ago, fluorescences disappeared as well, and only modern humans remained as representatives as the genus Homo. About uh, 10,000 years ago, the Neolithic Revolution started with the arrival of agriculture and farming. And um, this revolution reaches its culmination about 3,500 years BC with the origins of civilization and the law. This data highlight the so-called species problem already referred to by Charles Darwin. The concept of species is vague and arbitrary when it comes to evolution. The more we go back in the tree of evolution, the more useless the concept of a species becomes to distinguish between different types of hominids and establish a sharp beginning of Homo sapiens. Similarly, the difference between the ancestors of modern humans and those of modern apes is fuzzy and it is difficult to establish a sharp beginning of the genus Homo. Paraphrasing Dawkins' thought experiment when Kunt say, if you pull out your family genealogy going back millions of generations, you can never put your finger on an individual who was the very first Homo sapiens or the very first Homo habilis in the list of your ancestors. We can divide today the living kingdoms into separate species that cannot interbreed with each other because all the intermediate varieties are extinct. If all the ancestors were still alive, then there will be a complete continuum between every creature and every other, Richard Dawkins says. By provoking the disappearance of all intermediate species between modern humans and chimpanzees, natural selection worked in a way that makes it possible to have today a sharp distinction between the human species and all other extant forms of life, even the genetically closest one. These comments are collected in the following uh, six slides, so that you can read them afterwards calmly, if you wish. Actually, we derive the concept of a species from the human species as it is today, to the end of delimiting humanity from the other 
extant forms of life. According to Richard Dawkins, the disappearance of all intermediate species is a fortunate accident, one of these apparently ordinary things that are more magical than any miracle. It is the magic of reality, the magic of evolution. If all ancestors were still alive, the boundary of humanity would be ill-defined. There would be no observable bas basis to establish clearly who is a human being. The extinction of intermediate varieties is the most astonishing upshot of natural selection. Species once lost don't reappear, Charles Darwin says. So it may be useful to keep in mind these points. This statement is wrong. This statement is misleading. This statement is right. If you are not amazed by disappearance of intermediate varieties, you have not understood what evolution is all about. But what is disappearance of intermediate forms useful for? We come to the second point, Richard Dawkins' amazing declaration. Please read. Dawkins' declaration continued. In this declaration, Richard Dawkins suggests that there is a moment in evolution where humans cease to be a Darwinian population and ought to behave according to moral laws and values that then derive from Darwinian principles. Richard Dawkins acknowledges that the roles of human moral behavior then come from biological evolution that is, cannot be explained by material causality. Dawkins actually formulates in scientific terms Kant's moral proof of the existence of God as the moral author of the universe. Species didn't evolve into other species. Life evolved by incredibly tiny leaps and magical disappearance of intermediate varieties into the sharply separate human species we know today. The principle that every single generation belongs to the same species as its parents and as its children holds only for the human species as it is today, that is, the Homo sapiens personalis. In fact, the concept of human species proves very useful in the context of law. The human person and her rights are acknowledged by virtue of her belonging to the human species. The fundamental rights of a person should not depend on her belonging to a subgroup of humankind. The legal basis for the ascription of rights has to be observable. The basic piece evidencing personhood is the human body. If all the extinct ancestors were still alive, then there would be a complete continuum of bodies filling the gaps between humans and other mammals. The ascription of human rights could be a question of arbitrary decision and racism would become predominant. Darwinian evolution makes sense as preparation to moral evolution. 
Homo sapiens is supposed to become Homo sapiens personalis and behave according to the golden rule. The disappearance of intermediate forms is highly useful to the end of founding a coherent human legal order. Moral philosophers like Peter Singer, who claim that the idea of human rights is inherently arbitrary, have not understood what evolution is all about. This is the magic of evolution. Species once lost don't reappear, Charles Darwin says. On the part of nature, the gap between humans and other extant forms of life will never be filled again. Playing evolution backwards and blurring the lines between humans and animals could be silly on the part of humans. On the other, on the other hand, as Richard Dawkins emphasized, humans should despise Darwinian natural selection as a motto for how we should live and not try to do what Hitler tried to do, produce a superior race. Humans are called to evolve by We come to point three. In the light of Dawkins analysis, we propose the moral and legal responsibility model for the origin of humanity. The appearance of a moral code and law marks the moment when God transforms the existing human animals into human persons. And God performs this transformation by substituting the animal life principle with a spiritual rational soul, according to Thomas Aquinas' hypothesis of successive ensoulment. According to Richard Dawkins' moral sensibility, we assume that God bestowed the first human persons with the spiritual powers strong enough to master perfectly the selfish Darwinian propensities. The moral and legal responsibility model distinguishes between the fuzzy species Homo sapiens and the sharp species Homo sapiens personalis. Notice, however, that the distinction between human animal and human person is fitting to explain the creation of the first human persons, but such a distinction is no longer fitting, fitting in the context of law. Once the first persons appeared, the human animal becomes the observable basis of any consisting, consistent legal order. Clear signs to ascertain when the first human persons were created are achievements that reveal rational personhood with awareness of moral and legal responsibility and these agree with the origin of the civilizations when the Neolithic Revolution reached its culmination around 3,500 years BC. An important data is that the guesstimates of the Homo sapiens populations, population at the origin of civilization lay between 5 and 10 million. So we reach this conclusion of part one. Does this conclusion of part one fit to the Christian teaching on original sin and atonement? I address this question in the following part two. Here is the plan. First of all, some cons and pros. Con one. Con two.
Pro One. Pro Two. Pro Three. The meaning of original sin is twofold. Firstly, it refers to the first transgression of God's law in human history. Secondly, it refers to the state of lack of original righteousness deriving from the first transgression. One coup, couple or several ones of the first human persons trespassed the primeval God's commandment. This transgression was the original sin as the first sin. As a consequence, the first sinners lost the state of original righteousness with perfect control over the selfish Darwinian propensities. And also as a consequence of the first sin, all human persons created after the first trespass come into existence lacking original righteousness. This deficiency is the state of original sin. Why and how is the state of original sin propagated? We come to point four. Thomas Aquinas, in his Summa Theologica, addresses several questions which are relevant in this context. In the state of innocence, could there have been generation? The answer is yes. And here the astonishing reason Aquinas gives for this. Next question. In the state of innocence, would men have been born in a state of righteousness? That is, suppose Adam and Eve didn't sin, would their children have been born in a state of righteousness? The answer is yes. Next question. Would these children have been born confirmed in righteousness, so as to be unable to sin? The answer is no. So, even if humanity descends from a single couple, Adam and Eve, generations may have passed before the appearance of sin, and hence original sin does not require in principle that it is committed by a single pair from which every single human person genetically descends. Suppose that generations passed before the original sin was committed, then one would have two groups of people after the trespass, persons in a state of original sin and persons in a state of original innocence. Question. Is it fitting for the group of persons in a state of original sin to live together with the group of persons in a state of innocence? Astonishingly, Thomas Aquinas does not address this question to the best of my knowledge, but in my view the answer is no. The main tenet of the Christian faith is that people who are in a state of sin need redemption to receive eternal life. By contrast, people in a state of righteousness could not need such a redemption. Hence, maintaining people in a state of righteousness together with people in a state of sin would not be fitting. Certainly, this uh, statement uh, deserves to be studied and discussed more in depth, but for the aim of these presentations, it seems it suffices to refer to the key principle Paul establishes in Romans 11.32. We come so to point five. This applies to original sin. This principle means that for God has bound everyone over to original sin 
so that God may have mercy on all the sinners. We have done these conclusions of part two. In agreement with this conclusion, I present now in part three some hypotheses, three hypotheses, and finish with some concluding remarks. Hypothesis one. At the beginning, there was a several million population of human animals, and God transformed the about five till ten million animals into persons and bestowed them with the spiritual powers strong enough to perfectly master the selfish Darwinian propensities. One couple of these persons trespassed the primeval commandment of God and lost the state of original righteousness with perfect control over the selfish propensities. God treated those persons who didn't sin the same way as those who sinned and all lost the state of original innocence. So, according to this hypothesis, one, the consequences of the first sin propagated in the beginning naturally from the sinners to all other existing innocent persons and thereafter to all descendants at the very moment of their generation. Here the comments collected. Hypothesis 2. At the beginning again a population of human animals with several millions of individuals. God selected one couple, Adam and Eve, of these millions animals and transformed them into persons in the state of original righteousness. Adam and Eve receive mission from God to multiply humanity, that is, the people of God, by generating new persons in this state of righteousness, that is, by generating children, but also by transforming existing human animals into human persons, likely through some ritual of giving a name. Thereby, Adam and Eve were called to become the ancestors from whom all humans originate as persons, although not genetically, and to be priests, in a sense, serving to build up the people of God. The two first persons, Adam and Eve, trespassed a primeval commandment of God and lost their priestly power to generate children of God, that is, people in a state of grace. Humanity entered the stage of good and bad, and God transformed all other human animals into persons in a state of original sin and engraved on their hearts the foundation of law, the golden rule, to protect them from each other. According to Hypothesis 2, the consequences of the first sin didn't propagate laterally to other existing innocent persons at any moment. The lack of righteousness emerged in all persons coming into existence after the fall at the very moment of their generation. God didn't take away his grace from persons who didn't sin, but 
doesn't give original grace to the persons he creates after the first sin. Here, the comments collected. In both hypotheses 1 and 2, only people in need of redemption remained on earth, and all people descending genetically from the primeval persons are conceived in this state of original sin. These are the implications of hypothesis 2. These implications are in accord with Romans 11.32, with the declarations of the Council of Trent and the scientific data. In our view, hypothesis 2 fits better to divine justice than hypothesis 1. We come now to hypothesis 3, which is a variant of hypothesis 1. At the beginning, again, a several million population of human animals. God transformed one couple of human animals into persons, Adam and Eve, and sent them to multiply the people of God, like in Hypothesis 2. Adam and Eve transformed, with the help of God, other human animals into persons. And all these uh, persons were in the state of original grace before the arrival of the fall. Some of the first human couples trespassed a primeval commandment of God. And God took away those who kept the state of innocence and common priesthood to heaven. Then God transformed all other individuals into persons, into in a state of original sin, like in Hypothesis 2. Those who kept the state of original righteousness, were translated into heaven in a way similar to the patriarch Enoch and the prophet Elijah, who were translated by God according to the biblical narrative. One could even speculate that the high priest Melchizedek, having neither genealogy nor end of life, may have been one of those primeval righteous persons who were translated into heaven. He then came again as righteous king and priest of God Most High to found the order according to which Jesus Christ is priest forever. Here the comments collected. Notice that hypothesis 1 could be interpreted in the sense of hypothesis 3, and thereby one would overcome the problem of the lateral propagation of sin to persons who didn't sin. An interesting point is that Jesus Christ himself refers to the beginning of humanity only once to teach that the prohibition of divorce was an explicit primeval commandment of God. The interpretation that the first sin consisted in rejecting this prohibition would speak in favor of hypothesis 3. So we come to point 7, 
concluding remarks. First remark, the assumption that the creation of the first human persons happened at the dawn of civilization is compatible with St. Paul's with St. Paul's teaching and with the dogmatic declarations of the Council of Trent. Answer to Con 1. One has to discuss Adam and Eve starting from the axiom original sin and redemption and not discuss original sin and redemption outgoing from the axiom Adam and Eve. It seems to me that is this is the um, real outcome of Pius twelve Humani Generis. Answer to con two. Regarding burials, one should keep in mind that burials alone, without signs of worshipping, don't necessarily reveal awareness of responsibility toward God's law. The burials of Lenin and Stalin were probably among the most pompous funeral ceremonies in history. C.S. Lewis, in The Problem of Pain, presents a view which he agrees with concluding with these remarks. Concluding remark two. The assumption that God created the first human persons at the culmination of the Neolithic revolution is compatible with Darwinian evolution as well. There never was a first Homo sapiens or a first Homo habilis, but there was a first, a first human person. The claim that the emergence of the first human persons is not susceptible of a purely natural explanation and requires divine intervention should not mistakenly be interpreted in the sense that other events in evolution happened without divine intervention. Both the emergence of human persons and animals, like any phenomenon in the quantum world we live in, are God-given processes. God intervenes in both, although in different ways. Creating human persons through this appearance of intermediate varieties is for more magical, is for a greater miracle than created, creating them directly without transitional forms. This is the magic of quantum reality, which guides evolution by means of fortunate accidents to bring about the human observers who make science on the basis of experimental evidence and moral values. Evolution is the smartest form of creation. Thank you very much for your attention.